We are studying Nehemiah chapter 3. We're in a series of lessons on that chapter as we journey through the whole book of Nehemiah. Class today is in our motel room. I'm preaching at a nearby church. We're in uh, the state of Illinois, up on the fourth floor, in fact, quite a view. I look out and see trucks as they are traveling northward and southward, uh, goes up to Chicago, I-57, that area anyway. A good place to study the Word of God. It's been quiet up here this week, and uh, we have reached Nehemiah chapter 3, and uh, right now we're in a period of time where we have been covering just one verse per session, it's a little different tonight. Nehemiah 3, we will start at verse 15, and we will go through verse number 19. That span, that paragraph of Scripture. And the reason being, that will present to us the next gate as we watch work crews reconstruct, rebuild the gates of Jerusalem and the wall of the city. And uh, this gate will enclose, will encapsulate verses 15 through 19, as I've said. Let me show you the chart. I hope you can read it. We began our journey at the sheep gate. Then we went to the fish gate. Then the old gate. And then the valley gate. And our most recent lesson, the dung gate. Each of these gates has a spiritual, <clears throat> excuse me, a spiritual meaning, a godly application to our lives as we grow as Christians. Now, tonight's lesson will carry us from the southern tip of the city. Remember, the dung gate opens out into the trash heap of Jerusalem. We are now going to look at the, can you see it? the fountain gate and then we'll begin to go up the other side of Jerusalem rebuilding the walls the fountain gate and uh, we will uh, in just a moment we will begin to see what the fountain gate can represent in our lives now having shown you the map again Let's read our text, chapter 3, verse 15 down through verse 19. Listen. But the gate of the fountain, that's next in order. But the gate of the fountain repaired Shalon, the son of Colhose, the ruler of part of Mizpah, and Shalon built it, he built the fountain gate. He covered it. Ah, there's a new verb. He covered it, put a roof on it, if you will allow me. That's what the word means. And he set up the doors thereof and the locks thereof and the bars thereof. Then this additional note. And the wall of the pool of Siloa. Siloa. In the New Testament, that is the pool of Siloam. Uh, the water of the, the wall of the pool of Siloam by the king's garden. All these little geographical areas can be found, located by the king's garden and unto the stairs that go down from the city of David. The oldest part of Jerusalem was called the city of David. Jerusalem has grown, of course. After him, I'm reading verse 16. After him, we're going to read all the way up to the next gate. After him repaired Nehemiah, the son of Azbuk. Nehemiah. But it's not Nehemiah, our hero. It's not the Nehemiah, uh, the namesake for the book of Nehemiah. It's not Nehemiah, the cupbearer, and the wall builder, and the governor. Different Nehemiah. Uh, he's the son of Azbuk, the ruler 
of the half part of Beth Zor under the place over against the sepulchres of David where the kings of Judah are buried and to the pool that was made a reservoir, a body of water under the house of the mighty. We're going to talk about uh, these locations. After him repaired the Levites, Rehum, the son of Bana. Next unto him, Hashbadiah, the ruler of the half part of Kela and his part. Teamwork, groups working from the fountain gate on around the wall. Verse 18, after him repaired their brethren, Bavai, the son of Hinnadad, and the ruler of the other half of Kila, K-E-I-L-A-A, one half, the ruler of one half, the city's working over here and nearly right beside him, the ruler of the other half, they've come in to help rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Verse 19, our last verse. And next unto him repaired Ezer, E-Z-E-R. It is essentially, it's not the Ezra of the book of Ezra, but it's essentially the same name, Ezer, the son of Jeshua, the ruler of Mizpah, and another piece Hear that? Another, another piece of the wall and another piece over against the going up to the armory at the turning of the wall. We have got a very elongated, technical, and extremely practical text of Scripture in front of us today. By the time we get all ten gates combined, the composite of all ten gates. We're going to learn the geography of the city of Jerusalem. We're going to learn, and it's going to be beautiful, we're going to learn a composite, a general summary of God's plan for His children for the ages. I believe some of the names of these gates even point towards some prophetic future events. God has planned for planet Earth. And then we're going to learn, and this is what Brother Bagel's going to call it, then we're going to learn the secret of revival in my life and in my heart from these ten gates around Jerusalem. There's so much to cover. Let me begin with the gate of the fountain. Uh, just a little bit of vocabulary there. The gate of the fountain. The word that is uh, translated fountain, ayin, A-Y-I-N, a Hebrew verb, ayin. Uh, Eleven times it is translated well in our Old Testament. Eleven more times it is translated fountain in our Old Testament as here. But get this, 495 times it is translated one's eye. The eye. And of course, a whale is a in the ground, an eye out of which water can be drawn. A fountain is an eye out of which water bubbles and, and, and moves at the gate of the fountain. And then we'll learn about those who were repairing uh, that gate and that area. Quickly, some facts about the fountain gate. Preacher? What could the fountain gate represent? Actually, a better question, who could the fountain gate represent in my life spiritually? Here's the answer. I believe, not Brother Bagel alone, a plethora of Bible teachers believe that the gate of the fountain, the fountain represents the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God. Of God. Let me show you something. I've got to bend over. My little map had fallen. Sheep gate, that's where I got saved. Fish gate, that's where I become a witness, a soul winner. The old gate, that's where I learn I can't give away the precious truths that God has placed in my hand. I have to be an old-fashioned Bible believer. And the valley gate, 
I must work humility. I must humble myself in the sight of the and the dung gate. I must clean out my life. Clean out my life. And how can all these things be done through the ministry of the good Holy Spirit of God? In fact, and we looked at it quickly last time. I'll never have the fullness of the Spirit. I'll never have the power of the Holy Spirit till I've used the dung gate, till I'm clean. Pure till I've confessed and forsaken my sin. Then God can fill me with it. That's just a little foretaste of the spiritual truth uh, given us by the gates. The Holy Spirit preacher in the Bible. Moving water, I think, tends to be a picture of the Holy Ghost. Still water tends to be a picture of the Word of of Almighty God. Now, that's a good note to make right there. Uh, when it comes to moving water, John 7, one of Jesus' most famous utterances in the Gospel of John, verse 37. And that last day, the day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, probably the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus stood and cried and said, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believes on me, if you get saved, he that believes on me, the scripture said, out of his belly, out of his innermost belly shall flow rivers of living water, moving water, spring water, fountain water, rivers of living water. But this spake Jesus of the Spirit, moving water. This spake Jesus of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive for the Holy Ghost was not yet given. Pentecost had not yet come, for Jesus had not yet been glorified. The Spirit, the Holy Ghost, rivers of moving, living water. The first mention of the Holy Spirit, the first mention of the Spirit in the whole Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, in the beginning God created the heaven and there, the earth was without form and void, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of of the waters. There's that movement associated with the Holy Spirit of an Almighty God. So, so, and, and here's a way another Bible teacher placed it, and I love it. One of my heroes, another Bible. Water for drinking, that's moving water, came out of the well, came out of the fountain. With us, it came out of the spigot, came out of the tank. Water for drinking, the Holy Spirit. Water for washing, the bathtub. Still water, the word of an almighty God. So we're going to, now, we're going to talk about our relationship with the Holy Spirit of God. I'd like to do something, and uh, I I'm going to do it quickly, so if you're going to take notes, have your pencil or pen ready. Five key words in regard to my life in relationship as a Christian in relationship to the Holy Spirit. Learn these words. Indwelling, filling, testing, resisting, and power. We can find these five steps illustrated beautifully in the life of Jesus. I won't have time to go into detail. Preacher, what's that indwelling? Listen to me. That happened the moment you were saved by the grace of God. The Holy Spirit moved into your life, into your body, and now into 1 Corinthians 3, verse number 16. The filling of the Holy Spirit, oh yes, I want Him to inundate me. I want Him, notice the Holy Spirit is a Him, not an it. He is the third person of the Godhead. I want him to flood me with his influence, with his presence, with him. And your go-to verse there is Ephesians 5, 18. Be filled with the Spirit. And by the way, that's a present tense verb. It's an imperative movement. Constantly be filled. I need to be filled with the Spirit today and filled with the Holy Spirit tomorrow. It is a constant perennial. And then uh, testing. If you're ever filled with the Spirit of God, and, and uh, that's our goal, that there will be tests. The devil will oppose you. The devil will fight you. Jesus uh, 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 baptized. The Holy Ghost came upon him. That 
that inundating presence of the Spirit of God. And the Lord Spirit drove him, led him into the wilderness where he was tested of the devil. There will be testing that will come. Listen to this, Galatians 5, 17. The flesh lusteth against the Spirit. It fights against the Spirit. There will be testing. Let's say I-F-T-R, I-F, and what is R? It is resisting. It is resisting. Preacher, what, what do you mean resist? When the devil tests, I must resist. When the devil fights, I must have a way to come. And how do I resist? The word of God. Uh, the power of prayer. Here's how Jesus resisted the devil in his 40 days of temptation. It is written. It is written three times. Jesus said, "It is." He took the sword of the Spirit, which is a we learn to resist under the guidance of the Holy Ghost preacher. I F T R P in dwelling, testing, uh, uh, filling, and resisting. What's the P? Power. Capital P. Capital O. Capital W. Capital E. Capital I, Power. And, and how do you get that? If I get the Holy Ghost. It, he indwells me. He lived. Now he has filled me. Uh, now he's allowed me to go into testing. I'm not so sure. He leads me to that. And he teaches me how to overcome, how to be a victorious Christian, how to how to resist with the power of the word of God and the uh, on my knee and then power, the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of his presence. Let me read you a verse. Luke 4 14. After Jesus had resisted and become victorious over uh, the devil after he was tested and resent. And he returned. Jesus returned from the temptation, from the wilderness, in the power of the Spirit. He returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, the power of the Holy Spirit of an almighty God. We're to be indwelt by the Spirit we're to be filled with the will to pray every day. Lord, fill me with your spirit and don't let me grieve the Holy Ghost. That means hurt his feelings. Uh, don't let me quench the Holy Ghost. That means cool him down, cool him up. Oh God, I want the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the emphasis of the, that is the emphasis of the fountain gate, the gate of the fountain. Oh God, uh, to 2 Corinthians at the last chapter, the last verse, chapter 13, verse 14, Paul prays we'll know something of the communion with the Holy Spirit. The communion. Oh God, let me learn Him. Let me commune with Him. Let me love Him. Let me obey Him. Let me yield to Him. Interesting verse. Numbers chapter 11, verse 9. The manna. That manna can be a picture of the Word of God. Uh, that manna coming down every morning except the Sabbath for uh, the people of Israel. But the manna never came. Again, Numbers 11, 9. Until the dew had first fallen on the ground. The manna would not come till the dew. And the dew is a picture of the Holy Spirit. The Word of God will not come. I cannot learn the Word of God. I cannot glean from the Word of God. I cannot profit from the Word of God without first the dew. That moist, sweet, fertilizing blanket of the dew of the Holy Ghost be in my heart and in my life. Now, I'm getting behind, but I'm enjoying talking about the fountain gate and the Holy Spirit. The gate of the fountain repaired shallon, shallon, and the word shallon, it means uh, retribution. Retribution. If we're going to live the fountain gate, we'll have to obey God. We'll have to oppose God's enemies. We'll have to stand strong for the truth. Uh, Shalom and, uh, and those that helped him. I won't be able to go into all that. Un uh, and they built until the wall of the pool of Siloa by the king's garden. Just a quick note. The pool of Siloa by the king's garden. That is the New Testament pool of Siloam. Or Siloam. S-I-L-O-A-M. Both. In Hebrew and Greek, the word means sent, commissioned, like a missionary, like an apostle. And, and, and here it is. Here's Siloam in the New Testament. Jesus has just healed a man born blind. And how did Jesus heal that man? John 9, 7. Jesus said unto him, go and wash 
in the pool of Siloam. And he went his way. And he washed man born blind. And he came back seeing Siloam in the New Testament. Uh, we also came across, let me see if I can find it again. We also came across uh, the king's garden. Uh, uh, they're building the wall. Now, in verse 15, the gate itself is under construction. I, I believe I told you I would make mention of the fact uh, and uh, they covered the gate. They tell me, the scholars tell me, that is probably an indication that this gate had been allowed to completely, completely be demolished. Uh, this gate is, you got to build from the ground up. We are not here repairing as much as we're just absolutely building uh, the fountain uh, gate, even to the point that the roof, the covering had to be put on the fountain gate. It is a complete job. And then uh, after the gate, verse 15, the rest of the verses, we're rebuilding the wall. We're rebuilding the wall. Maybe it would be good to look back at our map. After the fountain gate in verse 15, the workers are rebuilding the wall now northward all the way up to verse 26. There's so many verses in the rebuilding of this section of the wall, obviously, obviously needing a lot of manpower, uh, needing a lot of hours of rebuilding uh, that it will take us this lesson, going to take us about, see where my thing about that far, and the next lesson will carry us on up to uh, what we're going to call, what is called the water gate. The water gate. So the rest of our text, verses 16 through 19, they're rebuilding the wall itself. But I do want to say something about the king's garden. The king's garden. The kings of Israel loved horticulture. They loved botany. They apparently enjoyed uh, God's creation in this sense. The flowers the plants. Remember Solomon was known for his knowledge even to the hyssop uh, that grows out of the, uh, uh, of the walls and uh, they had their garden and there, that, there are the king's garden. I read in preparation two complete sermons by great men of God of the past on the king's garden. The king's garden. And, and here's the bottom line. I won't be able to go into a lot of detail. Here is the bottom line. The king, think of the gardens of the Bible. The Garden of Eden. The Garden of Gethsemane. The garden where Jesus was buried and resurrected. John 19, 41. New Jerusalem is compared to a garden. Revelation 22, 1 through 5. And then the old preacher will say, and there's a garden of your heart. There's the garden of my heart. Am I caring for my garden? Spiritually, have I let weeds take over? Or have I done the necessary hoeing and plowing and harrowing? Have I broken up the hard clods of stubbornness and planted the seed of love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness? The garden of our hearts. Verse 16, very quickly. After him repaired Nehemiah, the son of Azbuk, uh, over against the place, against the sepulchres of David in the pool and the house of the... Oh, let's quickly, let's quickly look into them. Another Nehemiah. Could I make an announcement? Every Nehemiah will not be famous. Every Nehemiah will not get a lot of attention. Here's what I want to say. There's more than one Nehemiah. And here's a lesson this old boy needs to learn. There's more than one Michael. There's more than any one of us to serve God. Class, honestly, I look at serving God as a privilege, as an opportunity. It's not a right. It is an absolute privilege. I'm delighted to get to get in the car and drive to a revival meeting tonight and preach uh, the precious word, the very church where we had class in our last let. It is an honor. It is a prayer because God's got other Michaels. God's got other servants who will gladly do the work. There's more than one Nehemiah. There's more than one Philippians 2, 3. The attitude God wants to let each of us esteem our brother better than ourselves. There are other Michaels. 
Uh, there are other Davids. Uh, there are other Nehemiahs. Uh, there are other servants of God. And we are to recognize that fact. Uh, Nehemiah, the humble man, and uh, uh, other things that we'll have to save and get into later. So much I want to say there. And, and then our verse mentioned the mighty. Uh, uh, let me find uh, where I, they're building the wall unto the house of the mighty. Now the word mighty is Gibor, G-I-B-B-O-R, Gibor, and it means this, mighty warrior. It has this idea, a champion, a chief among the fighters in the army, and there's no doubt that this house of the mighty, it's a barracks where David's mighty men were housed years ago. 2 Samuel 23, a whole chapter is given to describing David's mighty men, the barracks where they lived. I want to make an announcement. God knows who his mighty soldiers are. God knows who his enlisted men are, but he knows who the elite are in his army. And I want to be, don't you class, I want to be my best for the honor and the glory of the dear Lord. Quickly, let, let, let's go to verse number, it would be verse 17. After him repaired the Levites, the Levites, and, and uh, it names some of them. Uh, uh, and, and let me say this. The Levites, the priestly tribe, came out of the sons of Levi. And the Levites, the sons, descendants of Levi, one of the sons of Jacob or Israel, they were full-time Christian workers. They were the ones in charge of the tabernacle. Uh, they were the ones that took care of the furniture. They were the ones that paced and walked with it as they would go across. They were given totally the and they were not allowed a tribal territory. All the other children of Israel got a little plot of ground. They could farm. They could call their own where they could build their home. Not the Levites. Uh, that's, a, that's for another lesson. Uh, they were given totally the preacher. How did they live? God gave cities. Just cities, they didn't own the land where Levites could house. He scattered them throughout the land so there'd be a godly Levite sitting near every citizen of, uh, of uh, Israel. That's a beautiful thought. Uh, and live near a man of God, have acquaintance and be able to get in touch with a real uh, man of God. But though they own no land, they own no property in Jerusalem, they own no, the Levites said, we want to help. We want to pitch in. We want to do what? we can to build the wall. And I think verse 17 mentions a city, Kaila, K-E-I-L-A-H, 18 miles southwest of Jerusalem. And the people of Kaila, they come up to help rebuild the wall. Verse number 18, look at it very quickly. Verse number 18, after him repaired their brethren, some brothers working together rebuilding the wall. All Bible brothers don't get along. Cain and Abel didn't get along together. Jacob and Esau didn't either. Amnon and Absalom, Absalom murdered Amnon. They didn't get along. But thank God in Christ, we ought to love our brothers. Get along with our brothers. Uh, uh, be of one mind and one accord in Christ with our brothers. And, and, and verse 19, it mentions the armory. They, uh, they were built against the going up of the armory. Uh, that's where the weapons were stored. Uh, the armory reminds me of Ephesians 6. Put on the whole armor of God. Uh, and uh, it said they built another piece. Verse 19, another piece of the wall a little bit at a time. Reminds me of how we're supposed to live one day at a time. Uh, it reminds me of uh, it's Lamentations 3 verse 22. God's mercies. Oh, how merciful God is. His mercies are new every morning. Uh, great is thy faith. Oh, my. Get another piece of the wall today. Grow a little more in Jesus today. Read a little more of your Bible today. Every morning, let's grow like God's mercies are new to us day by day by day. Now, let me make this brief observation. We're having two verbs for rebuilding the wall. Kazakh, to rebuild in essential, and Bana, 
to Baal, giving us an idea that some of the sections of the wall not quite as destroyed as others. But if we're rebuilding or if we're building from scratch, whatever we do, we're doing it for the honor and the glory of the Lord God Almighty. What shape is your garden in? Are you building it? Are you growing it? Are you de-weeding it? Are you living for Jesus? That's my question as our class ends.